the great goddess remembered? Last time, we started a new unit on gods and goddesses by taking a look at a couple of pantheons, that is, the way polytheistic uh, mythologies arrange the hierarchical relationships among gods and goddesses. This time, we'll start a, a four-lecture series on the goddess's place in those pantheons. We, in order to do this, we have to take a look at what's sometimes called the great goddess hypothesis, which has generated a lot of debate and is still a very controversial subject. The source of the debate are small figurines and carvings of the female form found in many parts of Europe as far east as Siberia, dating from about 30,000 BC to about, five, to, to about 5,000 BCE. The figurines are very small. They have exaggerated breasts and buttocks and vulvas and bellies, but they don't seem to have very many individualized features. They, there are, there are arms and legs, but there are no fingers or toes. The arms and legs simply taper off. Um, most of them have no facial features at all. The existence of these figurines and carvings has led a number of archaeologists and anthropologists and historians to assert that through most of the Paleolithic and into the Neolithic periods, the humans worshipped a powerful goddess. Um, perhaps the society she presided over would have been matrifocal, that is, woman-centered, maybe even matriarchal, in which the, uh, the descent is claimed through the woman's side. It's hypothesized, been hypothesized, that her age would have been a different one from what has succeeded. There would have been more equitable gender relations, for example. There may have been less violence. There may have been greater harmony with the, with the natural order than in any age which has succeeded. The hypothesis that there is such a, was such a moment in time when the goddess was very important is not precisely new. It had been floated already in the 19th century. What was new in the last half century or so was the valuation placed on this presumed period in human history. Earlier versions of the thesis had seen the goddess era as primitive, as archaic, and as happily transcended by the technological advances and sky gods and patriarchy which followed. Some scholars of the past half century or so, however, have seen a sort of appealing and therapeutic alternative to the materialism, to the violence, to the sort of spiritual bankruptcy, to the ecological disasters of the last three centuries of male-dominated scientific worldviews. The hypothesis has never been accepted by everyone, and as it has been pointed out frequently, there simply isn't enough evidence to support all of the claims that are made for the goddess hypothesis. The artifacts um, are widely scattered in time and place, and they come from different cultures. And there are, of course, no written records to support any of this, so that every single piece of evidence that turns up has to be interpret it interpreted. And how can we know what these figurines meant to a people over 30,000 years ago? We have no context for, con for interpretation, and so we have to conjecture in ways that we might find sympathetic, but that we can't finally demonstrate. We have no way, absolutely no way, of reconstructing the consciousness of a Paleolithic man or woman. Our thesis, therefore, might be more wish fulfillment um, as we impose our own understanding back on the people whose very consciousness may have been very different from ours than anything approaching a kind of scientific hypothesis. The debate still goes on. For a really nice summary of this debate, I recommend a, a book by Scott Leonard and Michael McClure called Myth and Knowing. They have about a 20-page chapter dedicated to this question of the goddess hypothesis, arguing, presenting evidence on both sides, and then giving you a very good bibliography. So if you get interested in this, and it is a very interesting question, you can have all kinds of places you can go. What we'll do for our purposes here is we'll try to assume, insofar as we can, a neutral position on the value question while at the same time admitting that there was a time when the goddess or goddesses were much more important they have been than they have been ever since. There have been, in fact, some great shifts in consciousness that happened through history which have altered the role and function and authority of the goddess in history. The first change seems to have occurred about the time that people moved first from hunting gathering and then nomadic lifestyles into agrarian communities. 
at the time of the agrarian community, some things seemed to have changed that in some ways started, began the undermining of the goddess's authority. And then in later, um, the, all of the populated parts of the world were going to be overrun by nomadic invaders. The Middle East was going to be overrun by Semitic invaders. Um, Europe was going to be overrun by the Indo-Europeans and India by the Aryans. Um, all of these new peoples, when they came in, brought sky gods with them. And when they conquered, they imposed their sky gods on cultures which may have been goddess dominated for a long time, and in the process changed consciousness and history forever. For now, the question for us is, um, what kind of evidence do we have for the importance of the goddess even in those early cultures? The problem is, for both sides of the question here, is that by the time we have writing, and hence we have some contextual materials to work with, the goddess has already been eclipsed by male gods. So the evidence for the existence of that goddess age has to be found in the margins and between the lines of historical documents that have already been rewritten by the time we get to them, making this a tricky way to search. Um, what we'll do in this lecture is to end with three myths that seem to suggest the importance of the goddess in early culture. We will take a look at one myth from Vietnam, one from the Brule Sioux from North America, and one from Africa. And in all three, I think we'll be able to see, even though the goddess has been to some extent overwritten, we can still see vestiges of that earlier power and importance. Before we get to those three, however, we'll visit a few other myths to see if we can tell how you'd go about looking for that substrata of the goddess which has been overwritten by later patriarchal cultures. We can start by revisiting a myth that we've already talked about several times in this course, that is Hesiod's Theogony. Hesiod was patriarchal, no question about that, he's patriarchal to the point of chauvinism in all of his attitudes about men and women. We've mentioned this a couple of times, but in works and days, his idea is that the Golden Age um, was occupied, inhabited entirely by men. Humanity was punished for Prometheus's theft of fire by the creation of woman. The woman was Pandora who brought disease and suffering and death and war into the world simply by being put into it. Now his theogony, as we've seen, is an account of how Zeus came to be king of the gods. We looked at this in Lecture 11. The Olympian society in Hesiod is solidly patriarchal. Hera may have at one time been a really important goddess based on the number and size of temples of hers that have survived, but in Hesiod she's been downwritten so that she is simply a jealous and shrewish wife. She is a consort. She is not really an important goddess on her, in her own right at all. But here's how, here's how we do that reading between the lines. If we read Hesiod carefully, we notice that the cosmos comes into being through entirely through female agency. Gaia, the earth, is the first to emerge from primal chaos, and she generates by herself Uranus, the sky, so that she could have a mate. And then between them, they produce the first generation of gods and goddesses, the titans. It's even been suggested that chaos itself, out of which Gaia emerges, is female-like and that it's a womb-like potential to generate matter, and the first matter that it produces is Gaia herself. Hesiod doesn't even want to give Gaia the credit for having the desire to create a mate for herself, so he introduces a, a, a male character, the, the god Eros, so that Eros stimulates the desire of Gaia to get this whole process going. And so that what he's done is he's even taken away female desire from out of that early story. For Hesiod, males are always more important than females in procreation because males beget life rather than merely bearing it. And so he quickly moves out of this female part of his story into the male story, Uranus and Cronus and Zeus. So that the goddess, to whatever extent she may have been really crucial in this early tellings of a story like this, gets buried under one of male dominance. There are just these hints of an older story behind this one that's now been entirely transposed into a patriarchal key. That's one example of how we might find some evidence of this kind of, of goddess culture underneath documents which have been entirely rewritten. Leonard and McClure give other instances of the kind of hints that we're looking at, hints of a powerful goddess that are hidden in later mythology. 
As they point out, in ancient Estonia, a, a goddess named Ma Emma was worshipped as the source of all life. At harvest time, people would gather around isolated trees and rock croppings. Those were considered her manifestations on earth and would lay the first fruits of the harvest on the ground, saying, I give to you what you have already given to me. The original inhabitants of Ireland called themselves the people of the goddess Danu. And they, it, there is a mound at Newgrange outside of Dublin, which is thought to be her place. And Danu was thought to be the womb from which all life springs and the tomb to which it all returns. Newgrange is an underground site and its entrance stones and its walls and its ceilings are carved with giant spirals and inverted triangles, which have been interpreted as symbols of the womb and the vulva. Once a year, on winter solstice, that underground sacred place receives a sunlight that comes through a hole in the roof just that one day, just that one moment, which is thought to have, to have been the idea of the fertilizing penetration of the earth by her consort, the sun. That site, um, suggestion of the real importance of a goddess is 500 years old, 500 years older than the pyramids. The Okanagan uh, Native Americans in what's now Washington State have a story about how the old one made everything out of a woman, soil and rocks and wind and trees and grass and ancients of the old world and animals and finally humans themselves. The Aborigines in what's now Arnhem Land in northern Australia trace their descent from a mother goddess named Kuna Pipi who existed before all things and whose body is still in the earth. In fact, her body is the earth. In the beginning, which they called dreaming time, Kuna Pippi brought ancestor, brought the ancestors to the land, and she deposited the souls of unborn children in sacred places, and then she taught humans the sacred dream songs. The earth is still full of her sacred places, and once in each lifetime, a worshiper has to go to one of them and via ritual and dream, reconnect with that dreaming time, that early time, where he or she will find his or her own twin soul, which always lives with the goddess. When one dies, the twin soul calls him or her back to the goddess, and he or she rejoins the goddess. Um, another one of these, these stories which suggests the, the, the power of, of a goddess culture. In the Enuma Elish, which we looked at uh, in our first unit, we remember that all of the original gods and goddesses were born from Tiamat and the cosmos was made from her body. There are many myths like these, um, all of which show traces of an original goddess myth beneath the version that we have. But now it's time for us to turn our attention to the three big myths that we're going to look at about goddesses who are also not just creator god goddesses but who are also culture heroes that is, who help prepare the world for human habitation. The first one is uh, from Vietnam. It's, it's a modern retelling of a, of a very ancient tale, um, and it's uh, sometimes called a taste of earth. Um, the story begins when a great bird flies out of the uh, sky and lands on the water where it lives, on the vast expanse of water where it lives for millions of years. It finally lays two eggs one red one and one ivory one. Out of the red one is, is, emerges a crow, out of the white one a swan. The golden crow born from this one egg becomes the sun and the white swan becomes the moon. Sparks from the crow create all of the stars and the heat from the crow melts the mountains and makes the sand and makes deserts. It also dries up some of the water and makes it into clouds which then can shield the earth from intense heat. In the heavens, the rest of the gods and goddesses are looking down at this new place and admiring it, especially the youngest of all the goddesses, Aoko. She's attracted to this new place. She looks down and says, ooh, let's visit it. She talks her sisters into changing themselves into birds, and then they all fly down to take a look. They spend a very happy day there, but Alko is so tempted by the sweet smell of this place, how beautiful it all is, that at one point she picks up a little bit of soil and she's tempted to take a, a taste of it. Her sisters all scream, no, 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 don't do it, but before they can prevent it, she's tasted it. And once she's tasted it, uh, just a bit of a taste of earth from the realm of desire, she cannot go back to the heaven of pure form. 
So when her sisters go back at the end of the day, she's too heavy to fly and she has to remain on earth. She changes back into goddess form and she spends a long night weeping. Now, a night is really long because we're told in those days um, a night was not just a typical earth night now, but it was about 10 years long. So for 10 years she simply stands there weeping. She weeps and weeps and as she weeps her tears become the first rivers of the world. When they flow toward the sea, all of the sea creatures down there who, who see these new currents coming into the water notice that there's something different about them. They have been sweetened by the tears of the goddess and by the soil of the earth. And this is exciting and new to them. They go to report their discovery to the dragon prince, um, and who's the son of the sea dragon emperor, and the, the dragon prince becomes a small fish and then swims upstream, up these new rivers, to see if he can find their source. As he swims, he discovers that along the banks of these new rivers, wherever the goddess's tears have traveled, there are new grasses and flowers and trees and everything is very beautiful. Eventually he finds Aoko still weeping and he changes himself into a handsome young man and he goes to try to comfort her. He succeeds so well at comforting her that she stops crying and when she stops crying the rivers begin to dry up and all these wonderful new plants along the bank start to dry up and die. So he dives into the sea and he changes himself into a golden dragon and then makes the first rain fall on the earth. Rain, it's a beautiful idea, the rain is artificial goddess tears. The rain replenishes the rivers and the vegetation begins to grow again and from the sky the dragon prince looking down can see that the rivers make the shape of Alco herself from her long beautiful legs to her hair flowing over the hills and the mountains. By now the two of them are in love and the prince is so charmed both by Alco and by the beauty of the earth that he decides to stay on land. From their union she bears 100 eggs and from each of which emerge, emerges one human baby. Um, and again, this is a kind of beautiful detail. It means that human beings are really half dragon and half goddess. They're the first people on earth. Then the pair spend 7,000 years together. It seems like only a few months to them because they're so happy. They raise their children. They teach them how to live on earth. They watch as one generation passes and another takes its place. They create human language. They teach their children how to make tools, how to make fishing nets, how to make fire, how to make shelters and clothing. They teach them how to grow rice and how marriage works and how to give birth and how to raise children and how to find salt. They spend 7,000 years teaching generation after generation of their children to live in this new beautiful place. Eventually, the dragon prince is summoned back by his father who's ready to retire and wants to turn over the kingdom. And so at the very end of the story, the dragon prince plunges into the sea, promising one day to return, but in the meantime, he leaves the earth to Aoko. Here, Aoko, along with the dragon prince, is both creatrix and culture hero. That is one who plants and who makes, creates plants and animals and teaches medicine and fire making and human institutions and generally helps people to accommodate themselves to life on earth. Mertzea Eliad in the myth of the eternal return says that early peoples almost always considered every important skill and technique and institution and law as one that they didn't invent for themselves but one that had been given to them by the gods. So every one of these things participates in the sacred. For Eliad, every one of those institutions is itself a kind of axis mundi. Aoko does that for her people here. And that is one of our myths in which we can see the, the terrific importance of the goddess um, in earlier times. Our second myth is also about a divine culture bearer. This one is from the Brule Sioux who at one time occupied parts of the Dakotas and Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin and Iowa and Nebraska and Wyoming and Montana and even a bit of southern Manitoba. Richard Erdos and Alfonso Ortiz who have collected this myth um, remind us that the Sioux were always a warrior and patrifocal culture, that is it's a male dominated culture. But they also say that significantly their most important legend is this legend, the one of the white buffalo woman. As one Sioux medicine man told these two authors, before she came, people didn't know how to live. They knew nothing. The buffalo woman put her sacred mind into their minds. The story begins 
many, many years ago, when one time there was no game and the people were beginning to starve, the chiefs held a council to decide what to do, and one day they sent two young men out to see if they could find, locate game somewhere. The two young men come across a young, beautiful young woman coming toward them wearing white buckskin. They know that she's holy, that she's Wakan, because she isn't even walking, she's floating as she comes toward them. And so they know that she is someone very holy. Nevertheless, she is so beautiful that the one young man can't resist reaching out to try to touch her, and the moment he does, he is instantly destroyed. Um, the other one is told to go back to camp, and when he goes back to camp, he is to tell his people to build a medicine lodge and then to await in four days she will come to them and she will bring them some really important gifts. Four days later, he goes back and has his people do this, and four days later she shows up and she shows them how to make an altar. And then she takes out of her bundle a sacred pipe and she fills it with red willow bark tobacco and shows them how to light it. The smoke arising from the bowl, she says, is the breath of Tunka Sheila, the great grandfather mystery. She teaches them prayers to say with the pipe, songs to sing while filling it, how to hold it first up to grandfather and then down to grandmother earth, now to the four cardinal points. When they use the pipe, she says, their bodies will be living bridges between the sacred earth and the sacred heaven, and they will unite everything on earth. Sky and living things and grass and trees and people all into one great family. She explains the symbolism of the bowl of the pipe and the stem and how they have to be decorated, and then she teaches them the seven sacred ceremonies in which it will be used. Both men and women, she said, must help make this pipe so that it can bind men and women together. When a man and woman are married from here on, she says, they will hold the pipe together while a red cloth is wound around their hands, tying them together for life. She has additional gifts for women. She reminds the women that they are from Mother Earth and that what they do keeps people alive and is as important as what men do. She gives them corn and wild turnips and teaches them how to make hearth fires and how to cook corn in a buffalo paunch into which you drop a red hot stone. She tells the children that they are the coming generation and are most precious and she has gifts for them too. Then, before she leaves, she says to the chief, remember, this pipe is very sacred. Respect it and it will take you to the end of the road. The four ages of creation are in me. I am the four ages. I will come back to see you in every generation cycle. I shall come back to you. And then she walks away, her job having been done, walks away outlined by the setting sun so that as she leaves, the people can see her change first into a black buffalo, then into a brown buffalo, then into a red buffalo, and finally into a white buffalo calf, which as the storyteller tells us, a white buffalo is the most sacred thing one can ever see. As she disappears, great herds of buffalo arrive, allowing themselves to be killed so that the people will survive. And the story ends this way. And from that day on, our relations, the buffalo, furnished the people with everything they needed. Meat for their food, skins for their clothes and teepees, bones for their many tools. One of the things the pipe does, as, as the white buffalo woman had told them, one of the things the pipe does is to bind all things together so that the buffalo are relations too. They are treated with respect and their blood must be carefully and ritually returned to the earth so the buffalo can be born again. The white buffalo woman in this story is a perfect illustration of a culture bearer and more. She's not just a culture hero because she says, the four ages of creation are in me. I am the four ages. And here we think we might be hearing another voice of the goddess from the distant past. Our last myth is yet another illustration of the importance of the goddess in early mythology. Um, it also makes a good transition to our next two lectures because it helps us to see what happens to the goddess when people settle down as to become agriculturalists. This one comes from the Wahungwe people of Zimbabwe. In this story, the great god Maori makes for the first, the first human, Muetzi, and he gives him a horn full of oil and then puts him in the bottom of a lake. Muetzi at, at some point decides, Earth has been, Earth has been created, 
And Muetzi one time asked for, per, for permission to go and visit Earth. Maori tells him, don't go, you'll be disappointed. It's a desolate, dreary place, and you won't have any fun there at all. But Moetsi keeps asking, and eventually Maori gives him permission, and he travels to Earth. He gets to Earth, and when he gets to Earth, he discovers that it was as predicted. Um, it's a really horrible place. It's cold and empty. There's no vegetation or animals. And he sits down and weeps at the desolation. So Maori, to help him out, sends him a maiden, Masasi, the morning star to be his wife for two years. He also sends with Basasi the gift of fire. The first night in the cave, they're on opposite sides of the fire, and they lie down, and Muetsi thinks, what am I supposed to do with this maiden? What, what next? What's, what's the next step? He doesn't really know or quite understand what it is that he's supposed to do, but intuitively, he takes one drop of oil from that horn that he has full of oil, he goes to her side of the fire and he simply touches her body with a drop of that oil. The next morning her body is swollen and she gives birth to grasses and bushes and trees. She keeps on going until the whole earth is covered. When the tops of the trees reach the sky, touch the sky, it starts to rain and they live in plenty from that moment on. Muetzi builds a house, he makes a shovel and hoe, he learns how to plant crops. Masasi catches fish. Masasi, remember, is the morning star. That would be Venus for us, the brightest object in the sky before sunrise. And quite clearly in this story, she is the virgin whose womb becomes the stage on which creation plays itself out. Because in this story, she remains a virgin. She's merely touched with the oil. The male may provide the creative seed, the oil, but she's the creator who swells with life and then gives birth to all living things of the world. When the two years are up, Maori takes her back, and Moetsi is devastated. How, what's he going to do now by himself again? So Maori sends him a new wife, Morongo, the evening star. Again, the same thing scenario plays out. They, they, the first night, they're on opposite sides of the fire in the cave. And so Moetsi says, this time I know what to do. And he takes another drop of oil and carries it over to her side. But what she does is she makes him smear that oil on his and her loins, and they couple in the cave. The next morning, she gives birth to chickens and sheep and goats. After the coupling the next night, she gives birth to eland and cattle. And after the third, she gives birth to boys and girls. When he comes to couple with her the fourth time, she warns him that now he's passing into the, the death zone, headed for death and danger. And that morning, when she wakes up, she gives birth to snakes and lions and leopards and scorpions. By the fifth night, when he comes to her again, she tells him that by now his daughters are old enough and he should couple with them. He does and, and eventually becomes a great mambo, a king of a great people. Morongo no longer sleeps with him. Um, she sleeps now with a snake and she no longer gives birth. One night, Moetsi comes to her wanting to couple one more time. She tries to prevent him, but when he enters her bed, the snake bites him and he soon grows very sick. As he does, as he gets more and more ill, rain stops falling, plants begin to wither, lakes dry up, animals begin to die, and humans are in very big trouble. The children realize that Moetzi's illness is what's destroying the health of the land, so eventually they kill him, and they choose a younger mambo, and then the earth returns to health. Clyde Ford, in his book, The History with a the, the hero with an African face says, this story tells a lot of things. It's a story of a progression from divinity to humanity, from a soul god, Maori, to multiplicity of the created world, from the progression brought about by the goddess in her various roles. The goddess is the virgin, crea the creating stage on which the rest of creation will unfold. Then she becomes the temptress, seducing her partner into creating new life with her. Then she becomes the cosmic mother, from, whom, from whose body all living things emerge. And finally, she becomes the crone, the bringer of death, allied with the snake, and she brings death to her consort. Muetzi is sacrificed, and a new mambo is chosen whose youth and health can bring renewed life to the goddess's creation. This is a very old and very widespread spread pattern in mythology, and we will take a closer look at that in the next two lectures. The point is, again, as all three of these stories have tried to indicate, that the goddess is the eternal principle, while her consort needs to be replaced each year to make the crops grow, to make nature fruitful. It seems that 
in Zimbabwe, the chief was actually killed every four years and a new one chosen as a way of keeping the goddess's creation fertile. Um, in the next uh, myths, the next two lectures, we'll see that this becomes a huge myth. The consort has to die in order to keep the goddess fertile. He becomes the fertilizing seed, and once he's done his job, he's finished, and she carries on from there, bringing new life to support humans who are also her children. She is the eternal cycle of life. He is the creature of time who passes from birth to maturity to death within her eternal cycle. Much more of this in the next two lectures. So these are some of the ways the goddess is remembered, reminding us of her importance long ago. As a final footnote to the Muetzi story, in some versions he returns to the sky to become the moon who forever now pursues Masasi, his first wife, the morning star, across the heavens trying to recapture the happiness of his first marriage. As Ford says, this is also mortality in pursuit of immortality, humanity in pursuit of the goddess. Much more of this next time as we have just begun to launch ourselves into these great vegetative myths which we'll take a look at in our next lectures. And we'll begin with a very, very old, old myth about uh, a very, very uh, important such couple, the goddess and her consort, Inanna and Demuzi, from ancient Sumeria. That's next time.